So I just, uh, just, I wanted to spend some time and encouragement in, in the time in the, in the Word with you. So if you just open your Bibles real quick, I want to share with you, you know, it's, it's not going to be super long, um, but I do think it's important that we open the Word of God and, and are uh, challenged by it um, this morning. And so just go ahead and open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. And what I want to do is, is challenge us with this idea of contentment. And really what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be talking to you about um, really what God has challenged me, what God has challenged our family with since being in Cambodia. All right, this is our first furlough. Um, we've been there for four and a half years. And, and in those first two years, God was doing something pretty incredible in my life. Um, and, and I just want to share with you a little bit and, and maybe encourage you as well. You know, it's interesting. When we look around us, this idea of contentment is actually pretty foreign, in my opinion. And why wouldn't it be? When you look at everything that goes on, when you, when you watch TV, when you look at billboards, when you look at, at advertisements, what are they feeding you? Discontentment. Right? They, you got to have the latest phone. You got to have the latest clothes. You got to have the latest car. You got to have a bigger house. You have to have the bigger boat. Whatever it is, you have to have it bigger and better. And marketing, adverti marketing advertising or agencies, they thrive off of that. That's where they, that's, if anybody's a marketer here, I apologize. But that, that's really, that's what you're doing. You're sowing seeds of discontentment. That's what these companies want to do. And so it's, it's no, no doubt that this idea of contentment is kind of all around us. And I, this morning, I want us to look at what is the biblical view of contentment? What does it look like? What does the scripture have to say about discontentment? Because the danger is not really this insatiable desire for something bigger, something better. It's a danger because it begins to creep in to our spiritual life. Right? It, it, it invades our doctrine. It invades our theology and what we believe about God and how we're to respond to him when things go poorly, when things go badly, and when, when we think or when we don't have what we think we should have. And so four years ago, my wife and I and my family, we moved to Southeast Asia as missionaries, and we had a plan. We had a very specific plan of what we were going to do. In a short order, God ripped that away, and he changed it. And in that first year was possibly one of the most challenging years of my life. Um, and I'm just going to share with you a little bit about what happened in that first year. And this list is not for you guys to feel sorry for me. It's not a woe is me list. This is just to give you an idea of what I was dealing with, what we were dealing with and challenged with as God laid these things into our life. So when we first got there, within a week, um, this is what started happening. We had $2,000 stolen. We had rolling blackouts with no electricity for six to eight hours every day, sometimes at night in 112 degree weather. My wife was six months pregnant at the time. We had children, our children were bullied by adults, which forced us to move houses several times. We had five moto accidents, one that resulted in a fractured elbow. Dengue fever, our whole family had dengue fever at one point, at one time, six, uh, or uh, a week after our daughter was born. We had sicknesses every two weeks. I had a wallet stolen with debit cards, license, ID cards. Uh, we had a trip to Thailand for medical emergencies several times. Uh, multiple MRSA infections that resulted in hospitalizations. One of our kids sliced their eye open. Um, you know, I had an appliance explode in our house. I, I had debilitating headaches for five months. That was everything I could just to get out of bed. Um, you know, we had a, a family vacation uh, uh, canceled and, and lost money because they thought my wife was too pregnant to fly. And so they literally at boarding, they, they denied her uh, access, and so we had to walk away. And then our team leader died suddenly that first eight months that we were there, and then COVID hit, right? And again, that's, that's, not, that's not at all a woe is me list. That is just the facts. And I remember that looking back on this, it was Thanksgiving time when our, when our team leader died, and we were left alone, um, it was around Thanksgiving. He, I just flew back from Thailand. He was in a coma in Thanksgiving. And I sit down at the Thanksgiving table, 
And we have, a, we have a, a tradition with our kids and with our family that everybody goes around and says what they're thankful for to the Lord. And it kind of goes oldest or youngest to oldest. It gets to me. And I remember sitting there going, I don't know what I have to be thankful for. And my wife, being the good wife that she is, firmly, lovingly, but sternly said, you need to say something. And so I remember saying tongue-in-cheek, my pillow. I'm thankful for my pillow. You know, that's, I mean, kind of sounds weird, but in Cambodia, that actually is, can be, uh, pillows are expensive. They don't always have pillows. And then I remember in just thinking about that, it kind of opened the floodgates as I started thinking about what I was thankful for to God. For the next 10 minutes, I just started, it just started exploding with what I was thankful for. And what ended up happening in that moment, in the midst of complete and utter defeat, I realized that I had nothing to complain about. There was, there was nothing to be upset about. It, really, who do I think I am? That I would expect or demand or think that God owes me something or a certain way of life or that because I gave up this and I gave up that, because I gave up a, a, a wonderful job, because I gave up church, I gave up family to move overseas to do gospel work, that he owes me something. Who do I think I am? And what had happened is, is I had allowed discontent to come up into my life, and it affected my theology. It affected my understanding of who God is. and It affected my understanding of what God and how God works. And one of the songs that we, that we read is, or that, that we sang this morning is, he's been so faithful to us. He's been so good to us. And I was seeing of all the goodness of God. But do we really? When bad things happen, do we really? When we don't have or the kind of life that we think we should have and we don't uh, when, 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 when challenging things come into our life, do we really sing of the goodness of God? Or do we question why God? That was, my, that was what I was doing. I was saying, why God? Why are you allowing all this? And so this morning, I want to share with you these three things real quick. We're going to go through this very fast. What is contentment? What, why are we, or when are we to be content? How can we achieve contentment? And why is contentment important? And so in Philippians chapter 4, read with me. It says, uh, chapter 4, verse 10. It says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, or for I have learned to be content whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means and also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. So we see here discontentment and contentment, this idea of contentment that the Apostle Paul speaks of. And he's writing to the church of Philippi from jail in Rome, and he's facing certain death. And at the end of his letter, Paul writes kind of a, a thank you letter of sorts for the gift that the church of Philippi has sent to him. And it's in the midst of this thank you that Paul reveals to us what he has gleaned over his life. It's, it's like he's reflecting back on his life and seeing what he has learned and what God has done. And he offers us some valuable, valuable information on contentment. And so what is Christian contentment? What is this idea of Christian contentment? Well, the Greek word here that is used is to be content, self-sufficient, find resources in self, manage whatever one has. That's the adjective. The, the noun is, is, is satisfied in one circumstance or position in life. All right, that's, the, that's kind of the Greek words there. The Webster's Dictionary says, a state of mind in which one's desire are confined to his lot, whatever it may be, and Jeremiah Burroughs puts it this way. This is one of my favorites. He says, Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. That's incredible. 
Contentment freely submits to God's plan for our life. Not only does it submit to God's plan, but it delights in it as well. When bad things happen, do we delight in God's plan for our life? When we're dealing with challenges and struggles, do we delight in God's plan for us? I didn't four years ago. I was frustrated. But God began to take a surgical knife to my personal life and remove this idea of discontentment. So contentment, it's an understanding of God's goodness and gracious. If we trust God with our eternal state, we need to trust him with our finite state, knowing that he will always bring glory to himself in every circumstance. And so the question is, when do we be content? Well, look at Philippians chapter 11. When to be content. He says, not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. And notice that Paul says he learned to be content in whatever circumstance he was. And, and this Greek word learned here is, is it means to be taught, to come to realize or to understand. And I love this because Paul came to understand what true contentment was. This was something that, that even the great apostle Paul learned over the course of his life. He came to realize and understand how to be content through various circumstances that came about. We move through this short passage, you're going to see a progression emerge. He, he begins with this idea that he had to learn or come to the understanding of contentment, but then he moves to now having or possessing that knowledge of contentment. It's pretty fascinating. And look at verse 12. He says, I know how to get along with humble means. And the word for know is to have the knowledge of knowing how to do an activity. And Paul uses this term two times in verse 12. And he's telling us that through various circumstances, he obtained the knowledge of how to be satisfied with his circumstances and position in life. And he uses a figure of speech that we call merism. And he uses it three different times. This idea of merism, or, or if, if you're unfamiliar with this, figure of speech. It's a rhetorical device in which a combination of two contrasting parts of the whole refer to the whole. So in examples here, we have humble means and prosperity, two opposite and everything in between, right? Being filled versus being hungry, everything in between. Having abundance and being in need and everything in between. And so the first merism Paul uses is humble means and prosperity, Paul, uses, Paul tells us that, that he knows how to get along in humble means. And another way of, of saying this is, is to be without honor. And when we think back, how is Paul without honor? Well, we're not going to turn there for time's sake, but in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 through 28, he gives us a long list of all the different ways that he was dishonored or that he lived in humble means. He was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was stoned, he was imprisoned, he was scourged. He was in danger a lot. And I, I, my wife and I always laugh. We're like, man, when we compare our list to his list, it's like, I'll take my list any day, right? The man knew what humble means was. The man was faced with challenges, diff challenging difficulties. And so Paul was living in humble means. But he also says that he learned how to get along in prosperity. You know, this is the contrasting part of the first merism. Paul says that he learned how to live in prosperity. And I, I find this phrase interesting because isn't it easy to live in prosperity? I mean, we think so, but I, I don't know if that's necessarily accurate. Is it, maybe the phrase should be, is it, is it easy to live in prosperity a godly life? All right, living a godly life in prosperity is not as easy as you might expect because the Christian life requires us to surrender our passions, to surrender our desires, to surrender our ambitions to pursue Christ. Having wealth can cloud that judgment. It can blur the line sometimes. It's not bad. It's not evil. It just, it's different. It, it offers different challenges. And so here Paul says that he had to learn how to live in prosperity. And look at the last part of verse 12. We see the second merism here. <clears throat> which is what? Being filled and going hungry. 
In every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. And Paul uses again this phrase to learn. However, it's actually a different Greek word than before. This one is, is used here only in the New Testament. It's only, only used here, and it refers to something mysterious. Something has been revealed to him. Something incredible has been revealed to him. He's learned this secret. And this, this learn, this secret of being filled and go, is, is being filled and going hungry. If you ever want to check your heart, go a couple days without food. <laughs> right? Being hungry can really show you where you're at. Right? We have a term for that. We call it hangry. Right? You can get hangry. People tend to get more and more irritable and short-tempered when missing meals. You even see this in Scripture. Right? People that miss meals, but then when God nourishes them, when God provides for them, guess what? Their countenance changes. They're uplifted. They're encouraged. And so Paul says, I've learned to be content in both being hungry and being full. The third use of merism is a short, is a sort of refrain of his first merism. It's during times of abundance and when suffering need. The words of abundance and prosperity are same, which is to have an excess or more than is needed. But the term suffering need, is, it's different than humble means. Humble means is to be, um, it's a social uh, a word. And suffering need is more of a physical word, right? To be destitute or to be poor, to have nothing. Whereas humble means is to make low in social status. So one deals with the social side and the other one deals with the material side. And so Paul uses these three, three merisms to tell us when we need to be content and when is it? All the time. All the time. We're to be content all the time. You don't get to choose. I don't get to choose when I get to be content. My circumstances do not dictate my contentment in the Lord. Oh, but do they? Do they? I think sometimes we allow that to happen. Is it learned? Yes, Paul learned it. Is it a process? Yes. But at some point in your walk with the Lord, you're going to need this characteristic of a Christian, which is called contentment. Having that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit, which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly advice. Now, how to be content? Paul can, comes to the conclusion that there's a secret to all of this. There's a secret to living a contented life, whether you're walking through the valley of shadow of death or laying down beside peaceful waters. Paul learned it, and he tells us what it is in verse 13. What does he say? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And this verse is grossly misused out of context. It's not about climbing that mountain. It's not about winning that, taking that game-winning shot. It's about living a contented life in Christ no matter what your circumstances are. We can only live contentedly when our eyes are fixed on Jesus Christ. Hebrew says, The author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the same, and sat down at the right hand of God. Consider him. Colossians says that we are to what? Keep our eyes, fix our eyes on heavenly things and not on the things that are on earth. One of my favorite things about the verse in Hebrews that says, you, we are to run the race that is set before us. It's not, to, not the race you choose. It's the race that God ordains and sets for you to run. Because if I choose a race, guess what I'm choosing? I'm choosing a walking sidewalk downhill. Okay? But that's not the reality. And everybody's race is different. There are some of you in here that are, that are running races that are far more challenging than I could ever fathom. But the mandate is the same. We're to be content in Christ. Because it is the power of Christ that allows us to run it. Now, lastly, why? Why are we to be content? I'm running through this real quick. Why are we to be content? Well, Proverbs 19.23 says this, The fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one who rests content, untouched by trouble. In order for someone to rest content, you must first fear the Lord, which leads to life. If we are not willingly submitting ourselves to the plan that God has given to us, we are conversely not fearing God. 
If you are discontent, then you are distrusting God. Discontentment equals distrusting God. John Piper said this about contentment. I love this. He says, when you deserve hell, anything else is cause for celebration. I forgot that three years ago as I sat there, as I was questioning God and asking why, I forgot what I deserve. And I deserve nothing but eternal separation from God forever. By the grace of God, he went to the cross. By the grace of God, Christ died for my sins. And by the grace of God, I am what I am, as Paul says. He went to the cross bearing my shame, bearing my payment, becoming my guilt so that God's wrath toward me is quenched. And if I remember that, if we remember that, everything else is reason for celebration. I'm going to leave you with this. If you're having a hard time this morning with this idea of contentment, I want you to do this. Get a piece of paper out, split it in half with a column. And on the left-hand side, I want you to write down things that you have that you don't deserve. Okay? And then on the right-hand column, I want you to write down a list of everything you deserve that you don't have. And if at the top of that list on the right-hand side isn't hell, you've misunderstood the gospel. Because the only thing we deserve that we don't have is hell. Brothers and sisters, contentment with godliness is great gain, and it is to be exhibited in all circumstances, achieved only by remembering and fixing our eyes on Jesus Christ, which allows us that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit, which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, you are a good God. You're a good Father. In all of my days, you have been good and you have been faithful. Even when times when I don't think so, you are. And Lord, I pray that as we leave this morning, that we would have this quiet confidence and contentedness in knowing that you are on your throne, that you are ruling and reigning, that you have a plan for our life, and that no matter what, you are in control. And that we can love you, that we can trust you, that we can cast our cares and our anxieties and our worries upon you in knowing that you care for us. Lord, we love you. We praise you for the work that is going on around the world. In your name I pray, amen.